Good morning. Let us begin our prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Lord have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name. For you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving goodness, your kindness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. O oh Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or I speak any more of his name. Then within me, there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot, for I hear many whispering. Terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our re revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evil rulers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 69 responsibly by half verse. Surely, for your sake, I have suffered reproach. I have become a stranger to my own kindred. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. I humbled myself with fasting. I put on sackcloth also. Answer me, O oh Lord, for your love is kind. Hide not your face from your servant. Draw near to me and redeem me. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we must no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. <clears throat> Jesus said to the twelve apostles, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the household Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear then of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. What you heard whispered, proclaim from the housetops. 
Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? If not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother, her mother, <clears throat> and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> An image that might help us to understand a lot of what's being said in these readings is, I don't know, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have experienced a time where we've been very deeply asleep. And when we wake up for a while, we're kind of disoriented. We, uh, it takes us a while to adjust and to really get our senses back about us. And in looking at a faith life, a life of belief in God, and what goes on secularly, life can be like that. There's an awful lot that goes on that is both disorienting and distracting. And so we can get confused at times and we wonder what's right, what's wrong. And this gospel today really does seem to be confusing. But that's because we need to understand what God is saying and filter it through that message and not others. Because the problem that we're seeing when we hear from the prophet Jeremiah and we also understand what's going on in the gospel is that it's addressing when we try to take life on our own terms and not to its fullest potential, not to the way God reveals it to us. And that's a big problem. And of course, we don't have to go any further back. Well, we go back to the, the beginning with Adam and Eve, who were convinced. And if you think about the dynamics of Adam and Eve, you know, they're in this garden. Everything is wonderful. They're in communication with God, and they have everything they need. And God says the only thing they really can't do is just let that tree alone. And what's the first thing they do? Hey, let's check out the tree. What is it about human nature? What is it about us that we really don't sometimes take direction well? Or at times even conversely go against it? And that's part of an extreme of what we hear with, with the prophet Jeremiah. God wants Jeremiah to speak to the people. Now, Jeremiah is not stupid. Jeremiah knows that when you become a prophet, you speak God's word, and it all lines up with you being killed. Israel kills his prophets. So he's not convinced. It's not exactly the job you're going to sign up for. And what's really funny, uh, they're not humorous funny, but it's interesting, is the very first line of that passage we have from Jeremiah. Oh, Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. That's not the word. Really, it's, Lord, you seduced me, and I let myself be seduced is the correct Um Translation. Now, you can sit back and say, you know, hey, this is church, you know, back off. Let's set those issues or those understandings aside. But think about 
really what, what's being said. It's a romantic relationship that this is, Jeremiah is reflecting on what God has, God has, God has drawn him in. And if you think about it, I'll give you a really good image. Just imagine me, you know, 20, 30 years younger. All right. I'm meeting my wife, Sharon. She's not my wife at the time. Just imagine I got my dandelions in one hand, my best lime green leisure suit on. I've got candy, MMs. Yeah. And I've got my Fabio hair done. Yeah. All right. It's funny, but if you think about it, when we approach somebody in a romantic sense, what do we do? And it's the same thing that God does. It is, is really when we care for someone and we're attracted, or there's, there's that relationship that, that's beginning, is, is we move slowly. We show our caring. We give gifts and we recognize beauty. That's the seduction that God uses or employs or is a part of his relationship with Jeremiah. Jeremiah is here. He's already at the end of the story. I'm going to get killed. And God is saying, forget that for a moment. And God helps Jeremiah to understand how wonderfully created he is and how much God loves him and how important it is that Jeremiah fulfill the will of God and gives Jeremiah great gifts. He's a very human prophet in the sense of the way he lived and the way he's portrayed in scripture. And to recognize the beauty of that relationship because no one wants to jump into death, but certainly one wants to live in love and love in such a way that there are no conditions in that love. Where else do we see that? The prophets image Jesus Christ. God so loved the world, he gave us his son. And he didn't give us a son to die, period. He gave us his son to show us his love. And even if that should mean that he would have to die, he will do it because of the love. And so that's what Jeremiah is saying. But, you know, he was enticed, he became, you overpowered me, you prevailed. Your love overwhelmed me. Who would not be overwhelmed by the love of God? Well, then in the next line, we have these people saying, all right, violence and destruction. You know, all these things are going on, and, and there you go. Let's get back to the gospel, though. What is it about people when they make or have a religious conviction, and it's not necessarily that they're standing on a corner on the soapbox, or they're, 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 they're Bible banging, and they're, they're telling you you're going to go to hell if you're not going to listen, but people who just are trying to make a go of it, that they receive a hard time. We see it quite a bit. We see a lot of, in smaller and greater ways throughout our history, but even now, and again, we're talking about ourselves as Christians, that when someone tries to live the way of God, particularly if it is different than we believe, or others believe they receive persecution. What is it about that? And again, you don't have to look far or hard to find that. Find that here. You've got to believe the way I do. We want for ourselves the ability to choose and direct ourselves as we see fit in our own faith, but yet we won't afford that opportunity to others at times. You gotta, if you have faith, be like us. That's hypocritical. So what Jesus starts out with is he talks about the truth. And you know what the truth is? It's very, very simple. Is that we need to live authentically. True to ourselves and true to the will and the love of God. Because you know what? When we lie, remember, maybe maybe some of the other ones may not, because maybe the generation didn't use it, but remember when you were pulled aside by your parents and you were told the fact that, you know, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Obviously, that was kind of like really grained in. 
but it's true in a sense that we really, the lies come out. You can't live a lie forever. Same thing with gossip and bad behavior. We may think that we get away with stuff, but we do not. And it's not because God reveals this to us, shines a big light on it, all of a sudden we're, you know, we're right the guy. It's because you can't sustain things that are not true and that are not of God. And their ultimate damage will be known. So again, we get back to the truth. All that other stuff is childish. It's immature behavior. Because you can see the feet or hear the feet saying, I want my way. And then we try to evoke pity or gather people around us to support us. And sometimes that leads to people leaving. Truth, get back to that. That's the important thing, to have that integrity. And so what we hear, and integrity, and, and when you have that, there's a difference between being hypocritical and just being weak and imperfect as we are. Because as sinners, God forgives us. It's that hip hypocrisy that, that where we know it's right, we can, but we choose to live a life otherwise and try to force others into that. Think about for a moment, well, here we are. We're here in the Episcopal Church at St. Anne's. Down the street. What about them? <laughs> Those people. In Tickle, there's any number of Protestant churches around here. How many years have we been told, don't, don't go there? They're not good. They don't have the truth. Any number of things. Even they used to keep people from getting married, so I tried to keep people from getting married. Call it mixed religion. Why can we not respect the diversity that God has intentionally created in us? Why are we so threatened by that? Are you not worth more than many sparrows? And that's all of us. And so then Jesus gets into the what part is really pretty confusing unless you really kind of understand it, is the conflict in the family. Now, back in the time of Jesus, if you think about it, when people were coming to Jesus and they were becoming Christian, chances are, I mean, there weren't that many. It was just starting. So if you became a Christian and you were part of a gentle, Gentile family, you know, your family was out there with the Roman and Greek gods, and you were preaching of the one God of Jesus Christ, there was consternation and there were difficulties and frictions in there. But that's 2,000 years ago for the most part. Let's think of now. Again, we get into how we live with our sisters and brothers. Just think about in this very church. Does everybody here believe the same? Is it reasonable or correct or right to say everybody in this church has to believe exactly the same way and practice the same way? You should be standing, you should be kneeling, you should be this. You know, no. No. Imagine life if everybody was exactly the same. Yuck. That's horrible. We live for variety. And variety in the sense that, that it, it shows us things that we have not thought or seen on our own. And we can sit back and see the glory of God so much more clearly in that, that diversity. But yet at times we still go next. Oh, if we don't believe the same way, that's fine. How about a little respect? And the diversity of belief is what we're called to. So the family is the family of the church. Within our own little congregation, between us and other congregations. And that shows that love that God gives to all of us in the way we live. And so the gospel is not really that confusing when you think about it. It's illustrating to us this reality of, for some reason, the way we treat each other in our diversity of belief and pursuit of God. Even to the point, well, that just really doesn't apply to those people who don't go to church, does it? Sure does. Certainly it does. And it's a great invitation to correct, to reorient 
from our disorientation of being asleep in that part of our faith, it says to us that God has made us so wonderfully different. You think you found your faith? If you found your faith, you're going to lose it. If you found and God revealed, as he does to all of us, our faith, see, it's not all about us. It's about individually with the first person. It's all about all of us together. We're going to find the happiness we seek, not in our own self-indulgence, not in cloning everybody or forcing everybody to live and believe the same way. But we will find the ultimate true happiness in the beauty of the created world as God has made it. Not as we would be. May God be blessed. Amen. I invite you to stand if you wish at this time and let us profess our faith. We believe in one God. Virgin Mary, and this made man say he was crucified on the human society. He suffered death in his very interrogating the world again. In accordance with the scriptures, and he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Church and we have an orange one baptism in this system. The resurrection of the dead, and the world has come. Amen. of the people. The power of God triumphs over sin. Help the church to spread the word, word in hostile places of the world. May it remain fearless and committed to baptizing your people so that they will be welcomed into your kingdom. Loving God. Yeah. Guide missionaries to fearlessly teach the saving grace of your love. Loving God. Okay. Heavenly Father, creator of life, you have called your people from darkness into life through baptism. Help them to write your word upon their hearts and be committed to the teachings of Christ. Loving God. Assist world leaders to permit their people to follow the teachings of Jesus and practice their faith. May they continue to work for cooperation and justice. We remember you, re Ukraine. Loving God. Inspire our nation's representatives to acknowledge the diversity of their people and honor their viewpoints. Help them to defend our liberties while striving to maintain unity. Loving God. Encourage us to see the face of Jesus in the poor and homeless. Help us to share our goods with them. Loving God. Watch over our children so that they may be safe. Loving God. Make broken people whole again and reassure the dying of your promise of eternal life. Loving God.
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We are truly sorry. We humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways and we will write your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. <clears throat> All things come of thee, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, 
and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy Amen. Amen. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error, into truth, out of sin, into righteousness, out of death, into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O oh Father, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, <clears throat> through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Pass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Praying together with our sisters and brothers who join us virtually but are unable to receive communion physically, we pray our prayer of St. Alphonsus, mm -hmm. highlighting that we are united as the body of Christ, no matter where we are, as one family of God. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you, never permitting to be separated from me.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray together our post communion prayer. Eternal God, Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. For many years, some of you may remember, St. Anne's did a couple of blood drives every year. And um, we really had great participation. And Miller Keystone came here and, and set up in our very hall. But along came the pandemic, and they were no longer able to come to the church. Now, post pandemic or almost on, um, their staffing is at a point where they're only able to do the very largest of blood drives. Um, at one time, we would have been one of those who we get somewhere, I think the largest group we ever had was 26. But we had dwindled down to 10 or 12. And that is not enough for them to, to send the group out. So we've been trying to think of ways, and we put reminders in the bulletin and we announce them and so on. But if you're like me, I hear the announcements, and a week later, I forget to make an appointment. So Barb from Miller Keystone has made a suggestion and that maybe we do a group blood drive at their location on Cedar Crest Boulevard, right across from the hospital. Um, we're going to put out a sign up sheet out in the parish hall uh, with a spot for name, best day of the week, uh, time of the day, et cetera. Um, and this isn't a commitment. This sheet, it's it's a matter of we're trying to get a feel for whether there's enough interest to do a group setup. So what would happen is we'd actually do like we used to do here with appointment times. Uh, we could do shared rides or individually drive over there. It's close enough. Uh, or if somebody needs a ride, we take care of that as well. Um, Obviously, we all know how important blood is, and uh, especially this time of year, it's in dire straits. So um, we hope that we'll get some good reaction to that. And like I say, we'll have the sign-up sheet out here in the hallway or in the parish hall next week. And we'll run that for a couple of weeks and see what the response is and make a decision at that point. So thank you all for you. Thank you. As I promised last week, I have uh, in the bulletin the uh, some of the things that are coming up in the next several months, um, particularly as uh, many of you know, as I announced a week or two ago, I'll be on vacation starting later today, and that the next two Sundays, uh, we will have both services, 
and we will have guest uh, priests here for us. Um, and also for the people who join us virtually, I've already, um, I have the uh, live streaming, although it will be live, it will be pre-recorded. The service will be available both on YouTube and on Facebook. So please look at that. Also listed there, I do believe we still have about three um, services, memorial services of one form or another. The information we have is there now. And like I've mentioned in a number of times uh, in the last month or so, we've recently had a number of people who have passed away. We've had a number of baptisms. We've had a number of weddings. Um, and in the midst of the numbers, sometimes individuals can be forgotten or we've become distracted. Uh, I just invite you to reflect on and pray for those people to share the joy of those who have had baptisms and weddings and to remember the people who have passed in their families and in support thereof. Um, but anyway, the schedule's there also. And then of course, uh, very significantly, the last Sunday in August is the ice cream social. That will be the only day between now and the end of August, at least at this point, where there will only be one service and that'll be at 9.30 and then it'll be followed by the ice cream social. So throughout the duration of the summer, there will still be the two services in my absence and then when I return from uh, vacation. Also, Weissing uh, giant gift cards are available after the service. The last thing I'd like to address is it's been brought to my attention a number of times in the last couple of weeks that there is a misunderstanding that, uh, as you know, in the September, October, November, I will be going on sabbatical. Um, I will be returning because I don't know how to take that, but um, there is a story or a thought that it possibly when you're done with sabbatical, you kind of move on. Well, uh, as I've said more than once, unless I am offered double my salary or I win the lottery and can retire, uh, I plan on being back and being back as I have been here prior to that. So let me put that uh, misunderstanding to rest. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thank 